The salami makes me think of the Lunchables of my youth. Oh, dude. You know, I was never... I was never a huge fan of Lunchables. I wasn't, like, actively against them. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have, like, strong feelings. I just wasn't... was not a Lunchable guy. Hello and welcome to... Let's pod this. My name is Andy Moore. I'm joined, as always, by Scott Melson. What's up, man? Glad you're back. Thank you. Glad to be back in the upper room. Right. We, we missed you here in Upper Room Studios last week. Although, money thanks to John Rourke for... Hey, hats off to, to Mr. Rourke. Uh, excellent co-host. I like his like soft voice and how he asks you so many questions. It was like he was interviewing you the whole time. Yeah. He was like, tell me more about that, Scott. That's right. Tell me how you really feel. So that was uh, that was a really great episode. You guys did great, excellent guests. Um, uh, I think some really great perspectives. And really, it's been three weeks now since I've joined you for this because we did take an accidental week off while yeah. I moved. You moved. I was sick. It just couldn't make it happen. No good there. All right. So in the last week, as we joked earlier, we thought it'd be a slow week, and turns out it's not. It's been a very busy week. Um, so we're going to go through the usual. Uh, litany of issues here. We've got some uh, news stories, some uh, legislative recap, Pruitt watch, uh, <laughs> and um, and then at the maybe the bottom of the episode, the last half, we've got about a thirty minute interview with State Senator Greg McCourtney, who joined us by phone uh, just a little while ago, and we'll share that with you. Uh, we visited with Senator McCourtney about education funding, teacher walkout. Uh, living in a post-partisan world and a big Facebook post that he had the other day. So, Scott, let's uh, let's start by talking about what's been going on this week All in the right. news. Yeah, in the news this week. So we've got six, six stories this week instead of our usual five. I couldn't bring it down to just five this week, but... Um, we've got some of some of the usual players here, or uh, the Frontier, which we've had now. I think this is our third appearance of an excellent independent uh, news organization. Yeah, they're they're making an appearance uh, this week, leading off the news recap. So they've got a great article um, that looks at how several of Oklahoma's largest and most profitable companies are paying actually very little or nothing in income taxes. Specifically, so this is due to a provision in the corporate tax code called a net operating loss carry forward. Um, just saying that is about as much accounting as I know. So, Andrew, can sure. you? Sure. Yeah. So, a net operating loss. Well, there's two parts to this. Net operating loss is when your expenses exceed your revenue, it means um, your bills are more than your income, and then the carry forward um, is when is when you carry that that loss forward. So let's say we'll use round numbers and small ones <laughs> to make this easier to understand, I think, for all of us. So let's say your business uh, brings in $10,000 this year, but your expenses are $20,000. So that means you've got basically negative $10,000 in revenue, right? Like your, your expenses exceeded your revenues by $10,000. So you would pay no taxes this year because you didn't actually make any money. And you've got uh, an extra 10000 there to carry forward. So you could apply that to next year's tax burden as well. So next year, if you only made $8,000, you, you could write down all 8000 and still have 2000 left over to carry forward again to the next year. So you wouldn't pay taxes next year, and you would reduce your burden on the third year as well. Well, what happens with large corporations that have millions or billions of dollars in revenue is that they may have a really bad year. And they tend to stack things on particular years, right? They try to hold things off, hold purchases off, buy um, uh, PP&E plant property and equipment, buy all that in one year so that they kind of say, this year we're going we're gonna to spend all of our money, this is all the expenses, so that we have no income tax this year, and then we can carry that forward in the future. And it's a way for companies to avoid... Um, paying an income tax, even on years that they might actually be profitable otherwise. Like, you know, in one year they might be profitable, but because things were so bad three years ago, they're not paying income tax on the really good year. 
Yeah. So this that's and that's exactly it. That's what this article kind of focused on. And you know, it deals with several companies. It focuses on oil and gas, which is always a hot topic here in Oklahoma. Um, and uses a couple of our large companies as an example. You know, I found this interesting because as we've been talking about, you know, education funding and teacher strikes and raises, you know, one of the sticking points for any revenue package has been gross production tax. And one of the kind of talking points from industry has been, you know, we're already heavily taxed and they list things like, you know, um, they list things like excise taxes, they list things like income taxes as the tax burden that they have. And this, this article was pointing out, well, because of the downturn in oil and gas prices that really kind of hit in 2014, several of our largest companies took heavy, heavy losses. Now that they're profitable again, they're using those losses to essentially eliminate or significantly lower their tax burden now. And so I think that one of the questions raised by this article is, okay, you know, if you're going to say that like the gross production tax has to stay at 2% or can't go above 4% because of all these other taxes that you pay, it begs the question, are you actually paying those taxes or not? You know, and we're not here to make a policy statement about whether or not net operating loss carry forward is a good policy or bad policy. It's important to note out as the article to note that as the article does, that Oklahoma is not unique in this. Virtually all states allow net operating loss carry forward. Um, I think the feds do it too. Usually there's not a time limit. So this is a very, very common corporate tax and accounting practice. Um, but I thought it was interesting. Right. It's basically, if you have a really, really bad year, it can reduce your tax burden in other years that might be moderately good. Right. At some point it's going to run out. Um, but I think the issue, the reason it is worthy of a story is that at face value, everybody kind of expects everyone else to pay their fair share. Right. And right. and we, we don't get these kind of carry forwards on our income taxes necessarily. So um, yeah, that's a good point. All right. Next up is our friends at News OK. Um, so this, <laughs> this is a, a, an article that I think is interesting, number one, but two, I love elections. Like I love elections. I love election season. I love like the horse race. I love the politics. So anything that has to do with that is going to immediately like grab my attention. Um, this is a piece talking about Oklahoma's fifth congressional district, which is here in the Oklahoma City metro, um, portions of Pottawatomie County and portions of Seminole County. Seminole County. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a little bit of Shawnee and a little bit of what's yep. the big Seminole Seminole itself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, uh, basically, this is uh, Congress, Congressman Steve Russell represents the Oklahoma's 5th con- Congressional District. It has been a solidly Republican district for several decades now, I think since the mid to late 1980s. Um, however, News OK is publishing a report this week saying that that's starting to change. Um, this is no longer rated by national political handicappers as a solid Republican district. It's moved into the, to the likely Republican district, which, you know, no matter how you feel about that, I think is news, right? Right. It's a it's a change for sure. Like any kind of drift, and this is maybe indicative of a nationwide. I don't know if blue wave is the appropriate term for what happens here in Oklahoma, but um, I will say the quote that stood out to me in the article is from um, local pollster and political uh, genius, I guess, uh, Pat McFerrin. Um, nice guy, but he uh, talked about Steve Russell and saying that. You know, uh, Congressman Russell is someone who um, may vote with Trump on occasion, but you know when he differs from him. But if uh, if my memory serves, I believe 538 Politics has a tracker uh, they on do. how often members of Congress in both chambers vote with the president. And I think Russell votes with him m- the most often of any member of Congress. Have you looked at this? I have looked at that. I don't remember the, his number specifically. I think uh, we can we can fact check that here while we're on the. You keep talking. I'll look it up. And, uh, uh, but that's 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 why we included this. It's it is it is just interesting to me that a district that um, you know voted for the president by I want to say eighteen nineteen points um, in the last election uh, is now no longer solid Republican and uh, solid Republican and just likely Republican. So that was the impetus for that inclusion. All right, up next, third article this week from the New York Times. This is the latest installment of Pruitt Watch, the former Attorney General of Oklahoma, Scott Pruitt, who is now the EPA Administrator. This is uh, just a profile of uh, EPA Administrator Pruitt and kind of talking about you know what 
what people who watch this sort of thing and kind of prognosticate what they think his future political ambitions might be and how some of his activities at EPA uh, reflect his you know potential ambitions for higher office. It's a, it's a really interesting profile and deals with you know a prominent Oklahoman who is uh, rumored to be considering a run for statewide office in the near future here. So that's there for you as well. Number four, Nondoc, who I think has made an appearance in our news roundup every week since we started doing this. Uh, wouldn't surprise me. Um, there's a commentary this week in Nondoc that's looking at the education system here in Oklahoma. Not simply talking about, uh, I'm talking about kind of the state of it, not really focused on funding or fun, you know the teacher walkout per se, but really more looking at are we doing education in the way that one, makes the most sense, and two, is best for our kids. Um, it's interesting. You know, there's not specific policy proposals. It's really more kind of a theoretical, hypothetical article that, you know, honestly asks more questions than it answers. But I think the questions it asks are um, pretty insightful and interesting. So be sure and check it out. Next up, um, I didn't know what to call this other than like what the hell is happening in Chickasha. <laughs> so <laughs> this is okay. Then. This is from News OK. Um, there has been a request for an Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation to look into allegations of grade and attendance tampering in Chickasha public schools. I wish that I could tell you more than that. Um, that's really about all we know at this point. Um, according to this article, last year there were something like 5,500 grades and 18,800 individual assignment grades that were overwritten. So 5,500 like course grades, so like did you get an A or B or C in a course? And then almost 20,000 grades on individual assignments that were overridden in the school's grade tracking system. But it's, it doesn't seem to indicate who overrode those scores. Yeah, it doesn't say. Hmm. Um, this is an article from Ben Felder at The Oklahoman. Um, ben has good sources. He does great work. So I think if this is all he's... If this is all he's publishing, this is either all he knows or all he can say. Um, but yeah, what the hell's happening in Chickasha? Interesting. All right. And then our last last up this week is um, another article from Non Talk that again, this one I just this is I couldn't cut any of these, and this is another kind of what the hell article from Non Talk that is concerning, but also kind of funny. Um, the headline is the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture owes money to an unknown entity. So the story here is that the U.S. Treasury in November um, pulled back or clawed back about $835,000 of federal funding from Oklahoma. They pulled this from um, the Department of Agriculture to resolve a billing dispute. If you want to know more about that, you're going to have to go back and find the article um, on Nondoc from November. Um, however... <laughs> So what what then has to happen is that state agencies that lost federal funding because when the feds when the feds say hey there's a state that owes us money they just come take it mm-hmm. and they take it from any agency that receives federal funds because they can and so then even though these funds were a billing dispute with the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture the feds take it from anywhere they can get it. So then agencies that had lost federal funding because of this, they write letters to the Oklahoma Ag Department and they're pissed and like, hey, we lost our federal funding because you guys messed something up. Right, you Uh, owe us money. You owe us money. And (laughs) there are two accounts, one for $14,000 and one for $41,000 that are still pending because state administrators have not been able to identify the affected agency. So it, it sounds like the Department of Agriculture knows that they owe the money to somebody, but those people <laughs> haven't come knocking for it. Right. Man, I, I swear, I hope that it's not education or the Department of Health right. because those people need money and they better know if they are owed some money. Right. They. Uh, this is from uh, Jim Reese. He's the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, Mr. Reese says, we have a zip code and an agency number that doesn't correlate to anything Oklahoma has. It says Department 2563, so we don't have a place to pay. So it's a clerical error. It is. Someone left out a digit. Right. It's just, 
it was just funny to me that there's fifty five thousand dollars at the ag department and they don't know who to give it to. Sign me up, I'll take it. Yeah, right, dude. Let's let's fix it. this. We'll be happy to receive that money and put it to good use. Sponsor the pod. We'll That's run. Right. We'll we'll run Department of Ag uh, ads for, for the rest of the, the rest of I love the plants. decade. Right, I love right. plants and, agri- and agriculture and animals. Yeah. So, hey, uh, quick correction. We got update. update. Okay. Yeah. So I looked on five thirty eight dot com. That's all spelled out. Five thirty eight dot com. Uh, they've got a a tracking Congress in the age of Trump, uh, an updating tally of how often every member of the House and Senate vote with or against the president. Uh, I misspoke. Steve Russell is not one of the high. Well, it's still high. He has voted in line with Trump's position ninety two point eight percent of the time. But I was thinking of uh, another Oklahoma congressman. Uh, What's a Bradstein? No, Russell. Uh, not Russell. Um, that's what we're talking about. Lucas. Frank Lucas. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, congressman yeah, Frank yeah. Lucas, who has voted with Trump 98.6% of the time. Sure. Um, I'm sure Bradenstein is high as well. Um, because he wants to be the spaceman. Well, yeah. So he's been appointed to NASA, right? Yeah, but he um, can't get confirmed. So Bradenstein's slightly higher than Russell at 94.1% for Bradenstein. All right. Um, according to... Well, vote tallies, I guess. Indeed. 538 reports them, but they're the ones that cast the votes. So. Wow. Well, so that's it for Don't Miss This This Week, our news roundup. We will get all this up on the blog tomorrow. Like I said, it's a little bit eclectic in terms of subject, subject matter today, but I think it's all pretty interesting, so I hope you check it out. Excellent. So let's take a quick break, <laughs> and uh, when we get back, we will jump into the legislative recap part of the pod. Part of the pod. Pod parts. All right, we're back for the legislative recap. So this week, not a, not, not a whole lot of notable legislating occurred. Uh, this wasn't a deadline week. This was spring break, honestly. And so the House and Senate were marginally in session and even then poorly attended. Yeah, yeah. So pretty much quorum call every day. I think yesterday they were in session for eight minutes. Yeah. In, um, the, in the House, anyway. So, you know. Uh, some tweets, some angry things, oh, and really, it's just a lot of positioning around this education issue, right? So, various plans were released, lots of kind of discussion about it, and certainly a, a few bills. Lots of media activity um, from the members of the media that I've spoken with. They're all just scrambling, trying to get as many perspectives as they can. Shout out to a friend of the pod, Scott Mitchell. Yes. Um, and Mitchell Talks in, in News 9. You may know Scott from his uh, segments on News 9 on Saturday and Sunday morning. The hot seat. The hot on seat. Saturday. And Your Vote Counts on Sunday. If you don't watch these, you should. Both of those air at 7.50 in the morning, thereabouts, 7.45-ish. If you're uh, like me, you DVR it and watch it about 11. Nice. He also posts them on Facebook um, a little while later, usually about 9 o'clock, because they record on Friday, and they so they just post them, and I just catch them then. Although it has been funny on the times that they've uh, given us a shout out on there when I watched it live and it's weird to hear your name on TV. Yeah. Yeah. No question. Um, so, uh, but so anyway, Scott Mitchell has been doing a twice daily Facebook live broadcast from camps, 1910 cafe down here on 10th street and Broadway. If you haven't already look up Mitchell talks on Facebook or just news nine's feed, he posts these twice daily. Uh, and I myself was on the very first one with former state representative, and gubernatorial candidate Joe Dorman. Everybody knows Joe at this point. He's also the executive director of the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy. So he and I talked about kind of where we're at with this um, this teacher walkout education funding need debacle. We need a word that describes a really big, onerous, messy situation. My AP European history teacher always used the word kerfuffle. Ooh, well, it is a kerfuffle. That still feels too small. To me, there's kind of two big things that have gone on this week. So one is deciding the leadership in each house, right? So the, the or the leadership in each chamber. So leadership in the house, leadership in the Senate. They have to take all the bills that passed off the floor in the opposite chamber, review them and decide where what committee they go to. And that's not always a straightforward decision, right? It has to do with the topic of the bill. It has to do with which committee has jurisdiction over that topic. Um, so it's not, it's not as simple as just like, Hey, one through 10 here, two through 20 or, you know, um, 11 through 20 here, 21 through 30 here. So that's, that's a 
particularly when you consider the number of bills we're talking about, guys, we still have 850 bills alive, right? So you remember we started session with about 2,000 bills filed, about another 1,000 held over from last session. We're down to 850. The top, Ooh. the top 850 that Ooh, have I feel made, lighter already, <laughs> right? <laughs> that have made the cut. But that's that's 800, 850 bills that have to be decided. You know what what committee are they assigned to? So that's that's one thing that's going on um, all day, every day this week at the Capitol. The other thing, though, there is lots, and, and we're going to get into this a little bit more in one of our later segments. But there is lots of behind the scenes activity conversations. Um, not a whole lot of movement yet uh, about a possible teacher pay package. Um, word on the street is that there will be votes on revenue in the House next week. We don't know. We don't know what package it's going to be. We don't know if it's going to be enough to placate, um, you know, the uh, teachers' unions, the union of public employees, the support staff. You know, these groups that are pledging to walk out. Or walk off the job on April 2nd. No idea if it's going to be enough to kind of meet what they're asking for. And even if it's enough to meet what they're asking for, we have no idea whether it's going to pass. So there's a lot of open questions, but I can just, I can tell you there are some major discussions between groups that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be allies happening this week, trying to find a solution to, to this issue. I propose a five cent tax on plastic straws. Okay. Uh, that'll hit my wife hard. She, she's, she's a, a she's big a, straw consumer. She's, she's a pretty, pretty, pretty solid straw consumer. It is regressive tax, I understand, but just take the lid off and sip your drink like other, uh, anyone else. I, that's why I said no one needs a straw, right? It, it's not necessary. Right. Ex- I mean, except for like a slushy. Yeah. Because yeah. that's like isolanche on your face. It's just <laughs> right. no good. Right. right. So we, we did have uh, a couple things that I think are notable. Um, House and Senate JCAB, um, the Joint Committees on Appropriations and Budget. Um, each chamber's JCAB committee met today. They passed bills uh, that cap zero emission tax credits. So uh, for zero emissions facilities, most commonly wind in Oklahoma, this caps uh, the credits that they're allowed to claim every year at $35 million. Um, they... Uh, have been claiming, I think, between 85 and 90 million each year. Hmm. Um, this is a big deal, one, because it's a substantial tax increase on the wind industry. Yeah, not saying it's good, not saying it's bad, just saying that's what it is. Um, however, um, several of the members of the Senate JCAB committee were uh, debating against this today. I think, I think it was like past 25 12, I believe. Um, a lot of the debate against this was. One, we have agreements. The state of Oklahoma has agreements with these companies about what the caps on the credits are going to be, and we're kind of going back in the middle, right? We're kind of saying, hey, we know we said that you're going to have these credits for this long, but we need the money, so we're changing our mind. And concerns from some legislators are, one, what does that do for the next governor, for the next lieutenant governor, leadership of the state that are trying to recruit companies to come invest in Oklahoma and using tax incentives to do that. You know, if you're the leader, if you're the CEO of a company looking to make an investment, I mean, do you ask the question, well, hey, you made these promises to win and when you needed the money, you took it back. So are you going to do that to me? Two, these agreements are in writing. And so there's concern by some senators that this opens the state up to litigation. You know, not a lawyer can't give a legal opinion, so I, I don't I don't know how but you accurate. You can, it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, right, that's true. So I don't know how accurate that is, but those were the concerns that were brought up today. So that's that's really it in terms of kind of official legislative activity that happened this week. But that leaves us some extra time here to highlight a bill that I think you wanted to talk about, Andy. I know this is an issue about which you're – passionate that's near and dear to your heart um, because of the work that you do and have done for several years now. This is Senate Bill 1105, SB 1105. This is a bill on HIV education that right. has passed out of the Senate and I think has good prospects to pass in the House. Uh, one would hope, yeah. So this, so Senate Bill 1105 is um, has broad bipartisan support. Um, it, is, it was authored by uh, Senator A.J. Griffin and Anastasia Pittman in the Senate, and it is co-authored by um, Representative Marcus McIntyre and Emily Virgin in the House. You will note that there are two people in each chamber from each party. So that's uh, bipartisan, bicameral support. Is that a coincidence? Um, I'm, I hope not. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I, I, in my day job, I work in the HIV community here in Oklahoma um, and have done that for almost 
10 years now, and I uh, also serve on the the board of directors for the Oklahoma AIDS Care Fund, um, a wonderful organization that provides some much-needed financial support to the HIV community, including um, directly to some individuals who are living with HIV and AIDS. Uh, so this, this bill um, would update the language that in the health mandate. So the, there's been a health mandate on the books for a long time that requires that all students in Oklahoma receive some education about HIV and AIDS at least twice between sixth grade and 12th grade, right? So once, basically once in middle school, once in high school. Um, and it's like 45 minutes each time. That's, it's not a lot. Basically in your health class at some point, once between sixth and eighth, again, between ninth and, and uh, 12th. Um, but that, the existing law hasn't been updated since 1987. A few things. That's remarkable. Just kind of letting my, you know, just I'm gonna put my doctor hat on here for a second. I mean, what we know about HIV now versus what we know about HIV in 1987. I mean, it's, it's two different universes, right? Like it really is what, what we understand about the virus, what we understand about what it does, what we understand about how to treat it, what we understand about how it's transmitted. I mean, this is, this is, yeah. So the first cases of HIV are reported in the United States, including Oklahoma, were in 1981 uh, 1987, when this the first education mandate, the existing education mandate was passed, is the same year that AZT was approved, which was the very first medication to treat HIV. We're now on the third, fourth, and arguably the fifth generation of treatment for HIV, meaning things have improved a whole heck of a lot uh, since then. No one uses AZT anymore. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, in the original bill, the existing language only uses the term AIDS, does not use the term HIV at all, which is a big shift. Um, even the federal government, as slow as they move, changed their official website from AIDS.gov to HIV.gov this wow. year. And it's not just a semantic difference. I mean, that's yeah, that's basically a, a big a big difference. You know, clinically, I mean, that's that's not just that's not just words, right? And so uh, we ran a similar bill last year trying to get parts of it updated and it and it failed um, because the because the original bill the existing bill uh, or the existing statute is all all the language is about AIDS and homosexual activity um, which is just not the most accurate nor like you know politically correct terminology um, to discuss risk factors and people who may be at risk because it's a lot more than just that right um, but in to be fair in 1987, that's kind of the way the world worked, right? So, so now it's a much different. And so this year, it's um, we're really pushing uh, complete replacement. Just we kind of recognize, you know what? This whole bill sucks. This whole statute sucks. We need to just rewrite it entirely. And so we proposed, uh, we're proposing striking the whole thing and replacing it with new, updated, current language that reflects the state of the HIV epidemic today and the education that students need today, so that we can bring an end to this epidemic in Oklahoma. We got a really good shot. Like I say this every chance I get, we're not that far away. Um, and education is a, is the key to making this happen. Huge, 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 huge. I don't, I'll tell you, um, I read the bill. Uh, I read I read the bill cover to cover. It's only four it pages. It's not a big one. I mean, it's four pages of legislative language, dude. Like, yeah, but it's not, like almost let's, bullet points. Let's not minimize the what a work I You're did. You're a here. physician. <laughs> don't, I don't hear your complaints. <laughs> it's Mr. a Dr. Melson. It's a great. It's a great bill. Um, you know, if you guys, it's SB 1105. You know, if you got a minute this week, if you're calling your state senator, calling your state rep to talk about, you know, education funding, teacher pay, whatever, throw in a plug for SB 1105 and say you hope they support it. We did. This past Tuesday was HIV Advocacy Day at the Capitol. This is only the second advocacy day we've had for HIV at the Capitol ever. Last year was the first one. Last year didn't go so well because um, if you remember the news stories, some capital staffer sent out an email about cross-dressers being in the Capitol. Yes, I remember that. Which is unfortunate because it just referred to teenagers whom this staffer saw and I guess they assumed they were some they were people wearing clothing of a different gender, although all the kids had on jeans and t-shirts, so I don't really know what constitutes cross-dressing. Um, anyway, it was super offensive and it got out on Twitter while we were at the Capitol and it sucked for those teens. Yeah. I mean, like I had stood there and like 
I had to kind of look at some people in the eye and be like, I'm sorry that you came to the Capitol um, and were offended. That's not and the people that's supposed to go. And the people that are supposed to represent you are jackholes. Like that's. Well, and it wasn't intentional. I think this staffer messed up and um, and faced whatever consequences were associated with that. This year went much more smoothly. We had a we had a really great um, breakfast. Um, we had a guest speaker, Paige Rawls, who's a nationally known speaker. She was infected from birth with it, with HIV, and um, it was transmitted mother to child, and um, and so she grew up facing some really severe bullying. Yeah. And in light of what happened last year, it was a really great speaker and. She had some um, really helpful, kind, instructive words for our group, and then we all went to the Capitol and um, visited offices. And I still have a few uh, a few packets left to deliver. That's just awesome, man. That's just awesome. Thanks. So, well, I think that will wrap us up for legislative recap. Uh, we will be right back. Really hope you guys stay with us for the rest of the pod. Um, got two, I think, exciting discussions for you. First up, we've got an uh, interview with Senator. Greg McCourtney, state senator from Ada, um, who has some thoughts about a Facebook post that kind of went viral from his account <laughs> earlier this week. So we're going to talk with Senator McCourtney. And then as a f- kind of a follow-up to that discussion, we'll be back with um, kind of an in-depth look at some of the proposals for teacher pay uh, and public employee pay, as well as support staff uh, funding that have come out in the last week. We'll be right back. Uh, my name's Greg McCourtney. I'm the state senator for District 13, which uh, for, is Ada is the largest city, but Ada, Pauls Valley, Holdenville, and many, many points in between. That's a beautiful part of the state. I have some good friends down in Ada, Jim and Nikki Knight. Jim is the pastor for the Ada Church of the Nazarene. He was my college pastor um, for many years and Still is a good friend to this day. So adaoknaz.com is their new website. I just saw it the other day that they posted it. Huh. <laughs> they, okay. well, Ada, Ada is the center of the universe is, is what my wife has come to believe. <laughs> it really is a, a cool town. Yeah, and East Central is down there. Beautiful campus at East Central. I haven't been there in a few years. When I was a kid, you know, junior high and high school, we'd have, like, you know, competitions at East Central for – you know, whether it was, I think, like when I was younger, like Odyssey, you know, Odyssey of the Mind, which was like a kind of engineering kind of contest because because I was the super cool kid. Right. Well, and, and, and now you've dated yourself because it was Olympics of the Mind when I was a kid. But uh, <laughs> the, the, so but then, then they, they made them quit using Olympics. So you are younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> but I was also super cool. <laughs> well, Senator, we wanted to visit with you because uh, we saw your Facebook post the other day where uh, we kind of liked that you broke down kind of your view of, I, I guess, the four kind of main ideological, uh, political leaning kind of on the spectrum group. So as as a as a fan of psychology, a student of psychology, I'd like the four point Likert scale rather than a five point because with a five-point scale, everyone picks the middle. Um, and so you had four, four points. You had, uh, from we'll say on the, on the far left, the all-in education union supporter, um, who you kind of described as ideological Democrats, then the strong education supporter, uh, or the most prag- or included most pragmatic Democrats, and then moving to the right, some more the pragmatic Republican, and finally, on the far right, the ideological conservative. Um, so kind of... The, the far end on both sides, and then something a little closer to the middle, um, and maybe no group right in the middle, right? Everyone, arguably everyone kind of leans one way or the other. Yeah, everybody's got a side. Right, at least on certain issues. Yeah. So uh, I, we're curious, um, maybe what what led to you deciding to write this post in the first place? Really, I, I wrote the post because I was getting more emails, text messages, Facebook messages, uh, just more contacts than I could manage. And they come from all over the spectrum. I mean, you, you have, like you said, kind of the, the all in, it, we need $1.4 billion and not a penny less uh, for education. You, you, you get those people. And at the same time, I'm getting messages from people saying, 
you know, you better not ever raise a tax and uh, teachers are paid enough. We already spend way too much money on education. And, and so for me, this whole thing started as an attempt to find something that I could send to all of those people because there was no way I could respond personally to all of them. And so it ended up being a, a multi-page letter that I ended up writing, just <laughs> trying to to tell people what I see and, and hopefully help people kind of understand that uh, just because you see the world from one angle, uh, your next door neighbor probably does not agree with you. Right. And I, I think... We, one of our kind of core tenets with Let's Fix This is helping people remember that there are at least two sides to every issue. And and it's important to have that dialogue with people, even those with whom you may not see eye to eye, because you might you might learn something or at least gives you a, a more dynamic and a more diverse understanding of of all these complex issues. Yeah, I particularly love that you use you know, social media a social media venue as the opportunity to make this point because I think a lot of the, you know, what do you want to call it? Polarization, divide, kind of whatever words you want to use. I think social media, which could be and should be a way for us to connect with people who disagree with us really becomes a way for us to further insulate ourselves, right? Like most of the things that show up on your feed are going to be things that you agree with because those are the people that you follow and those are the things that you like and those are the pages you click on. So I love that you took kind of social media and use it as a, a venue to lay out that there's at least four different sides to this issue, and there's probably more than that. Uh, and, yeah, there, there are a whole lot more than that. Uh, those four categories, and, and I said in the post, I mean, they're incredibly broad, and, and most people fall into multiple categories. I I, I, I can find myself in, in categories two, three, and four, given, you know, depending on kind of the into or or you know it just it's such a complex issue i mean just speaking about education um that that it's hard to pin anyone into any one group most of the time sure and in your post you did kind of highlight that groups two and three with the pragmatic democrats and the pragmatic republicans that there's a lot of overlap in those groups and that you get a lot of messaging that um, from maybe people who are registered one way or the other, but it kind of comes from both groups. Absolutely. I, I get um, a whole lot of, <laughs> you know, kind of what, what you were saying about social media a minute ago, that, that everyone kind of has, has their world set up where, where they get their view reinforced over and over again. Um, you know, that definitely happens in the outreach that I get, I, I get a whole lot from the extremes and the people in the middle, um, are a little bit quieter, uh, but they make up for it in just the sheer fact that most people are somewhere in the middle. Uh, and, and it's not a Democrat Republican thing. It truly is, um, people in my mind who, understand that we've got a huge problem in front of us and the solution is going to be uh, a hard to find but but b it's going to have to be complex and it's going to have to be a compromise and they're willing to do that and they want to find that and i think that's the majority of people at least the the people that i represent do you do you think that the parties and and maybe a better way to say this is: Do you think that voters are be, are moving more towards the extremes or more towards the middle? I I don't know. Um, <laughs> I I think that uh, the system that we have now, the primary system in Oklahoma, um, and really in the United States, with so many districts that are going to be either Democrat or Republican. You know, the fact that your hardest election is in your primary makes the people running run to the fringes right? Uh, and never and never really need to get back to the center. Uh, and so I, I think it's the system is producing some of these issues more than I, I still believe. And, and I could be wrong that the average Oklahoman 
uh, is more moderate than we give them credit for. That's probably true. I think I think you're 100 percent right. Actually, that, um... we have a friend that jokes about being a a, a aggressively moderate voter, uh, and I think she gets a lot of flack for that because the folks on the edges have a hard time imagining that anyone could be in the middle and might vote with both parties on different issues. Yeah, I mean, I, that that's uh, <laughs> and that was, I think, a little bit of what I was trying to say in, in the post is that uh, the people who are one and the people who are in group four, I, I think that they truly believe that there are very few people in the middle uh, because they can't wrap their mind around the fact that someone is somewhere in the middle. That's just not how they see the world. And so they can't imagine someone else seeing the world with that, that moderate, we can do it multiple ways and, and still be okay kind of view. Right. So Senator, kind of going back to something that you mentioned a minute ago, that like whatever, whatever solution we find to this problem and, you know, just in case anybody that's listening to us is, you know, tuning in for the first time, we're <laughs> specifically talking about, you know, the fact that there's 70 school districts across the state that have said, hey, in two weeks, if there's not been a teacher pay raise of some kind, our teachers are going to walk off the job and we're supporting them. And the teachers have asked for a raise. They've asked for a raise for public employees. They've asked for a raise for school support staff and some restoration of other funding cuts related to education and health care that has taken place not just in the past couple of years, but really over you know, at least the last decade, maybe more. So that's kind of, I guess, the problem that we're dealing with. And you, know, you said that whatever solution we find to this is going to be complicated and it's, and it's going to be difficult to reach. And I wondered if you could maybe just talk a little bit more about why you feel like it's going to be, it needs to be complicated or like how the system's going to force it to be complicated and why you feel like the solutions are going to be difficult to find. Does that make sense? Uh, absolutely. And I, I first, I, I want to make sure and frame the problem. Uh, the, the problem is not that we're about to have a teacher walk out. Um, we're going, we're about to have a teacher walk out because we don't fund education as well as we should. And so I, I want to make sure that that's, uh, the, the problem is a poor education system. It is not a, a teacher walkout. The teacher walkout is a symptom that hopefully will force us to, I mean, it's kind of like at some point you get so sick, you, you have to go to the doctor no matter how stubborn you are. And, and hopefully hopefully that's where we are as a state right now, that, that we've finally gotten sick enough that we're going to go to the doctor and we're going to get this fixed. Absolutely. And, yeah, that's, a, I mean, that's definitely that's a much, that is a much better and more accurate framing of the problem for sure. So. I mean, I think OEA might could benefit from that talking point. Yeah, that's a great, that's a, <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a much better framing of the problem. So thank you for that. Right. And so uh, on the, on the complex side, it, it goes back to, I mean, I, I could, I'm a former preacher, so I could, could go for an hour on this one point probably, but um, it, it's complex for, for multiple reasons, but the biggest reason is the fact that in Oklahoma, you have to have 75 votes to raise a tax. And there is not a super majority in the House of Representatives, which means if we're going to fix this problem, we have to have a solution that Democrats and Republicans are going to agree on. Um, and that is almost impossible. And I, I am 43 years old. Uh, I was 17, so I was not old enough to vote when we changed the system so that you have to have 75% of the legislature to raise a tax. And since then, we have not ever done it. Um, and so we as a state made it very, very difficult to raise taxes. And I, I, I always love to point out that, you know, that is not Republican and Democrat. That is we, for the first 15 years, Democrats couldn't raise taxes 
for the last 10 Republicans couldn't raise taxes. Um, it's just almost impossible to do. And, and I said in, in the Facebook post, and I, I stole this from Senator Lonnie Paxton, um, I, but I used to be a pastor. And for those of you who, who attend church, if you had to, on one day, get to get your church together and you had to agree uh to to replace the carpet in your sanctuary you had to agree on (laughs) what color your carpet's going to be how thick your carpet's going to be how much your carpet is going to cost and how you're going to pay for it and 75 percent of the members of your congregation have to agree on that day to that carpet purchase you will never ever ever get new carpet in your sanctuary you know it will not happen at the church that i grew up in i don't think we could have gotten 75 percent of us to agree that we should replace the carpet <laughs> it would it would we couldn't agree on carpet it would have been carpet or wood or stone or so even just even just getting to carpet would have been impossible <laughs> right and, and that was i mean I, and going back to to the categories that i set out and, and one of the points that uh that you kind of make through those is that you know i i think Ten percent of your church um, is, is going to want hardwood or tile, and then fifteen percent of your church is going to say that the carpet does not need to be replaced. And so you can't even get well. You can get exactly seventy-five percent at that point to agree that you need carpet. That's as far as you can even agree at a seventy-five percent level. And then you have to actually get into the details, and at that point, it, it's absolutely impossible. That's a that's a really great analogy, and I think, aside from the fact that I think the rest of us feel like carpetbaggers now, I, the the fact that there's probably seventy five percent of the legislature that definitely agrees that we need more education funding and that teacher pay is too low, um, and I think maybe teacher pay has been the piece that gets the most press in all of this. Uh, But in your opinion, Senator, what is another very important piece of this request that hasn't been talked about enough in in the conversation or in the media? For for me, and I mean, uh, the the part that I will get most passionate about is is the need for more teachers that you you go to school after school after school that have. 30 kids in a classroom. I mean, you know, you look at a kindergarten classroom with 28 kids. Um, I mean, you give me a room with five kindergartners, <laughs> and I will probably go crazy. Um, and so to me, it, you know, not only, uh, and th- those problems probably, you know, <laughs> you, you have to fix them both at the same time. I, I think if you don't fix teacher pay, you're not going to be able to find enough teachers to to have smaller classes um, but at the same time we're going to have to find the money to hire more teachers along with paying teachers better because uh, because kids just I mean uh, 30 second graders 32 second graders in a classroom um, that's never gonna produce the quality of education that I think we want for our kids that's right I you know I have two children they're four and six and uh, my son is in kindergarten this year. My daughter's in uh, like pre-K. And I have started really pressing myself to think about what education in Oklahoma is going to look like in five years or 10 years as, as my kids move through elementary school into high school. Um, and it has resonated with me in a very different and very terrifying way about if these cuts continue. Um, and, I, you know, we've all seen the, the pictures of textbooks and and lack of supplies that have been going around lately and what what they have to look forward to uh through the rest of their schooling if we don't make a a 180 degree turn and make some very big changes so um i think as a as a parent of children entering the school system i appreciate your hard work and trying to get us there uh, I, I appreciate that, and I've, I have three of my own. I've got a, a freshman, a seventh grader, and a sixth grader in Ada Public Schools, and uh, so I uh, I have seen some of this up close uh, and personal, and and it's hard to uh, it's just hard to imagine really just the problems that we create by not 
educating an entire generation of, of kids the way that we should. Um, our future workforce is not coming out of school, in my mind, with the education that, that I would like for them to have for sure. That's right. Well, Senator, what's kind of your, what's, what's your, your gut feeling? It's, you know, we've got, I think, 11 days um, until, you know, the teachers have said this is kind of the, the deadline that we're putting out there. Do you think, do you think we'll get something done in the next 11 days? Or do you think that the, the walkout is inevitable at this point? Uh, I, I will give about a 5% chance that the walkout could be avoided. Um, and that's probably the eternal optimist in me. I'm a Chicago <laughs> Cubs fan, so I'm, <laughs> I, I'm used to you know, I, I saw one miracle come come true finally, and so I can always root for the next one. But um, now I I think that that the odds are very much in favor of the teacher walkout happening, and and I would think that it will not be very short. Hmm. The last one lasted four days. Yeah, four days was in ninety, I think. Yeah. West Virginia just yep. went for West Virginia just went for nine, I think. Hmm. No, I'm, I I hope that I'm wrong. I mean, I very very much hope that I'm wrong. But um, to get the size of solution this year um, that the teachers want, uh, it's going to have to be a bipartisan solution. And I just don't see a path to a bipartisan solution in the House of Representatives. Mm. That that divide between the two chambers has been really, I mean, so, I don't know, interesting, maybe heartbreaking to watch uh, this year. It was funny because when session started last year, it was, you know, let's fix this, we're still a very young organization. Really, it was our first full session to be involved. And at the beginning, everyone's like, oh, the Senate's going to be where all the problems are. And it quickly became clear that that was not the case. Like um, everything kind of broke down over on the house side. Now we're, we're starting to have a little man complex over in the Senate because <laughs> you guys always just pay attention to the house. That's, that's where the fireworks are. We're on the other side of the building. Just, just getting things done. <laughs> you, know, we're here, you know, it's, there's a, there's a quote that I've always found fascinating or I shouldn't say it's a quote. It's a story, I guess. I only know it from the West Wing. I've heard that it's attributed to like maybe Senator like Edward Kennedy or you know one of one of the kind of old stalwarts of the Senate. But a uh, a uh, a young congressman comes to Washington for the first time and he's talking with some of the leadership in the House of Representatives and he says, "We well, have some of the guys from the other side asked me if I want to go get drinks, but I said I can't go get drinks with the enemy." And his leadership said, "Oh, son, that's not." They're not the enemy. They're they're the opposition. The enemies of the Senate. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll I, I will admit that there is some of that uh, in in the state capitol too. That uh, that we like to spar with the other party in our chamber, uh, but but we like to try to 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 punk and pull something over on the other uh, on the people on the other side of the building, and that's probably. Uh, not helpful whatsoever in getting uh, getting things done, but but that is apparently a very very long health tradition. <laughs> so our uh, our last question is something we ask pretty much all of our guests, and that's how can we help? What's the best way for regular folks at home to get involved and and make a difference here? Uh, number one, contact your legislator. Hmm. Um, blanket emails don't help, uh, especially at when when we're at a time like this. I mean, our email boxes are are filling up faster than we can empty them at this point. And so, if if you see an email with every one of the 149 elected members listed on it, then yeah, uh, it's probably not going to be one that I read every word and hang on every thought. <laughs> um, and then you get more flies with honey. Um, and I, I really cannot overemphasize this point, you know, with the um, 
there will be a capital full of angry people, and I don't think that's going to help anything at all. And, and I really have a great fear that it's going to make things worse. Um, and that goes back to the, the 75 vote issue that, I mean, we, in, in the House, which we love to make fun of and, and love to, to point fingers at, you know, they, they have multiple times had over 70% of the people in that body voting to fix this problem. And if thousands of people show up and yell and cuss and scream at those 70 people that were willing to be a part of the solution, I have a great fear that you lose some of those supporters Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to make this problem worse. And so I, um, a, a civil conversation, a civil email with your representative is, is by far in times like this, the, the best way to, to move forward. I appreciate that. I think, um, those are both things that we try to instill in people that, that reaching out to your representatives, uh, your senators, uh, are, is the most important thing. And to just be cool, man. Like we don't, I know I've heard that, uh, that, uh, POE, the, the other education group has reserved the rotundas on like the second through the fourth floor for April 2nd. Um, so they will have their tables there. I'm sure OEA will be there, um, as well, but they won't, be able to have any tables because there's no the other group already reserved the space. So they're just going to spill into the hallways. And I'm afraid it's going to be a noisy day when nothing gets done. Yeah. 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 No, I, I definitely agree. I, uh, that whole thing is going to be quite the adventure for sure. And <laughs> I did not, I did not know that POE has, uh, has snagged the space in the rotunda that will, uh, and, and I, I mean, I think, again, that's a great example of, I mean, you have two education groups here in the state who cannot agree with each other, uh, and in large part at this moment are fighting with each other over what the solution to the education problem should be. Um, and that sure does not, uh, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't help anyone at this point, but that's definitely where we are. It really doesn't. On a related note, next Wednesday, we will be there for our first Let's Fix This Capital Day of the Year. We'll be down in the blue room, kind of in the corner by ourselves, helping people understand how to have a civil conversation. Um, If you are available at 9 o'clock in the morning, you'd like to stop by, we'd love to say hello, and I'm happy to let you have the microphone and say a few words to the crowd. I think Leslie Osborne is going to join us. Um, and, uh, that'd be great. Maybe Jason Dunnington and I can, can come down together and, and show people what bipartisanship looks like. That's right. And, and bicameral, uh, leadership there. <laughs> there you go. So Senator, the house and the Senate Democrats and Republicans all, all together. One big happy family. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, Senator, we, uh, we really appreciate your time sitting down with us. Really appreciate your thoughts and, uh, really most of all appreciate the fact that you're, um, you know, that you're there at the Capitol, you're doing the work, you're trying to be, you know, a, I think a facilitator of a solution um, and not not part of the problem. And uh, I think that says a lot. And we just really appreciate you coming on and uh, letting us uh, ask you some questions today. I'm, I'm happy to do it. And I, I told Andy this before, but I um, what what let's fix this is doing i mean the work you're doing the attitude you bring to it is incredibly impressive to me and um just for you guys and the board of directors and everybody who's put their heart and soul into this project i i give you a a big round of applause um because i i know you guys all have other things that you need to be doing with your life but (laughs) but you're putting a lot into this and and that's uh incredibly impressive to me so i I wanted to say thank you for what y'all are doing well thank you we appreciate that Senator, have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Good talking to you guys. Okay, we're back. A big thanks to Senator McCourtney um, for joining us for that phone call. And now we're on to our last call, last segment of the day. We're going to discuss the um, the all the different teacher we'll say teacher pay raise packages, but it's way more than teacher pay raises, right? Like that's the part that gets the press, which is why I asked 
the good senator that question. Uh, so so far we've got really four plans so far. However, we did see on Twitter as we started recording this that OEA plans to release their plan tomorrow, I guess on Friday, which will probably likely be about the time that this podcast gets out there too. So yeah. as soon as we release this, it'll be out of date. Just right. like an iPhone. No, no, right. I know. I was saying. I was like, why couldn't OEA do this today? So I can throw them in our like right. analysis here. Well, so Scott, I see that you've got a very uh, handy and attractive spreadsheet, including links to the plans themselves. Will we be making this spreadsheet publicly available on our website? Yeah, yeah. So some version of this is going to be available. Um, my hope is that we're going to have actually um, kind of this translated into like an infographic that's maybe a little bit. I mean, I love my spreadsheets, um, and I can certainly link to this one. Uh, this is maybe a little dense. <laughs> like yeah, but I like. I mean, but it, you've got it well organized, and I think it's helpful. And we did some color coding, but I think it's helpful to so people can compare line to line. Sure, sure. Of what's included, how much I see, like you know, you've got uh, teacher pay raise. Is it included? Yes or no? If so, how much? What the cost is? If there's a funding mechanism for it, you've got it broken down by the demands by the funding sources year one year two this is really well laid out i was i was nerding out hardcore when i was making this i appreciate that (laughs) i i need to send you i still have a spreadsheet where i started comparing all the different budget plans step up um the sos plan the restore oklahoma the all those things it looks similar to this so that makes me happy we're of two minds that makes me happy similar minds well, so I put this together, and there's really so there's there's a couple of ways to look at this, and I just you know there've been so many proposals, there's so much talk, and I, as I've been kind of following what's come out, one thing that I've been struck by is every single plan that has been made public. One of my kind of first thoughts has been, okay, I see what you're saying, that seems reasonable, but that doesn't address what they're asking for. Like, so I wondered what if we could kind of lay out things and and look side by side. Which which one of the plans that have been made public, you know, comes closest to addressing what teachers and public employees are asking for, and kind of to what degree does it do that, you know? And I I think that this is instructive as well because you know we asked Senator McCourtney um, in the interview, like you know he made the point that this is whatever solution we come up with is going to have to be complicated, it's going to have to be a compromise, um, and it's going to be difficult to find. And I think that this chart really lays out why that is. So we'll kind of dive in here. So the first part is understanding what exactly is, this is, what's the ask? So this is what teachers and public employees have come out and said, this is, if we don't get this, you know, we're walking off the job. Um, and it's broken down by year. So the 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 plan, if you will, the, 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 the ask, I can't think of a better word, I hate to use the word demand, um, that the teachers are making is a series of, Funding increases both both for the classroom, raises for teachers, and then raises for support staff, and raises for public employees phased in over the course of three years. So in the first year, the teachers were asking for a $6,000 pay raise for teachers, a $2,500 raise for support personnel, a restoration of public education funding cuts that have taken place over the last several years, a $2,500 raise for public employees, and then funding for health care that's been cut. Um, that all comes out to $812 million. That's an $812 million funding need in year one. To answer that, I chose three plans. There have been more that have come out, but I picked three that seem kind of representative of some of the different camps in this debate. So the first one is the 60 by 6 plan. This is a plan we referenced last week on the pod um, uh, that came out literally as Joe and I were right. recording. This is the Speaker McCall's this is press spe- conference. Speaker this. McCall, Representative Rogers, as well as the Public Educators Association, I think, right? Isn't that the other teachers union? Yeah. OE, Oklahoma Education Association is... Isn't this PO, Public Association of Employees? Hmm. We should probably edit this part yeah. out. It's click on the, <coughs> did you click the link there? P O E. Yeah, prof- oh, it's professional Oklahoma educators. Okay. Ah. All right, so let's back up. So the first one, this is the 60 by 6 plan. This is the plan that Joe and I referenced in the pod last week. It came out literally as we were recording. Speaker McCall's announcement. Right. This was Speaker McCall, Representative Rogers, uh, in conjunction with the professional Oklahoma educators. Um so this is a plan that 
really only addresses one issue of the demands. So it's a this is a plan for teacher pay raise, full stop. Does nothing to address the raise for support personnel, education funding, raises for public employees, or funding for health, funding for healthcare. And in the first year of the plan, it really doesn't address the teacher pay raise in a way that um, I think that you know the OEA came out and they said their their response to this plan was this is not this is not a serious offer. Um, it's a six year plan, and if you look at it in the entirety of the six years, it's it's actually not not a bad proposal in terms of how we should perhaps increase salaries for teachers. They call it 60 by six because the goal is at the end of the six years, a teacher who has worked in Oklahoma City Public School or in Oklahoma Public Schools for 25 years will be making sixty thousand dollars a year, which is substantial. It that's would, a lot. That's a lot. That would make us the highest in the region. It would raise salaries for first year teachers by about ten thousand five hundred dollars over six years. Um, so this is a a big serious, significant raise for teachers. However, as I said, it does nothing to address the other issues that have come up. The other big problem with this is there's no funding mechanism attached to it, right? It's great to say that we're going to pass legislation that raises salaries for teachers in this dramatic way for the next six years, but if you don't fund it, that becomes meaningless. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the big issues with 60 by 6 is that or there's really two issues with it. It doesn't address all the demands and there's no funding source. So I think that's why, you know, kind of the reaction to this was this can't be taken seriously. I don't think so. And from what we've heard from lawmakers, they're not taking it seriously either. I I mean, we saw legislators right away being like, well, how are you going to pay for this? Like, this isn't a real plan. Right. Right. And I was just irritated. This is a personal note, but like, yeah, it's a really fancy graphic and signs. And I was like, somebody spent money on these signs. And you don't even have a funding source. Right, right. Come on, like. And, and, the, and the thing that the thing that you're right on that. But but one of the things that's most frustrating about it to me is like when you look at that, like when you break down the pay scale and look at the actual raises that they're proposing, it's not bad. No, like, right. Like it's actually, it's actually, if, if you just look at teacher raises, it's maybe one of the best proposals out there, but it doesn't it doesn't address eighty percent of the stuff they're asking. Yeah, for. but I mean, you know, somebody can come out there the next week and be like, "Listen, we're going to do a five grand raise every year for the next four years, and that's twenty thousand dollars, and we're going to have the highest paid teachers and the most motivated workforce in the country." Right. It's a, this is our plan. It's right. the be best plan. Right. And someone's going to be like, "Oh, that sounds tremendous. Yes, we want that. How going to pay for it? I mean, hell, if right. I know, we're right. going to raise a, we're going to raise taxes on straws." And we just hope that people use a lot of straws. Right, exactly. It's a great example of a plan that stops about twenty percent of the way in. Right. It's like <laughs> they got it's like they got twenty percent of the way in and they're like, Yeah, this should be good. This is me with every like yard work program or project on Saturday. I'm like, here's what I'm gonna do. Plant eleven trees and build a big trough. Yeah. And then I start digging a hole and I'm like, I'm way in over my head. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on. Next is a plan, and this is a plan that came out on Wednesday. This is a proposal by Senator Bergstrom. Senator Bergstrom is a Republican senator, state senator from Adair, Oklahoma. Um, and he released this through his press office on Wednesday night. Um, no, Tuesday night. There we go. Um, so how does he stack up against what the teachers and public employees are asking for? They're asking for a $6,000 pay raise in the first year. Uh, Representative Bergstrom gives them $2,000. they are asking for a $2,500 raise for support personnel. Um, that's a $1,667,000 raise. Um, they ask for $75 million in education funding. He gives them $75 million in education funding. They ask for a $2,500 raise for public employees. He gives them a $1,000 raise for public employees. He does not include any funding for health care. Uh, and his total price tag for year one comes out to $266 million. All right. Now it may sound like there's a lot, you know, to be desired here with the plan that he's put forward, but you know what? He's got a plan that costs $266 million and he has $272 million of revenue hey. de uh, delineated to pay for it. That's some cushion there. So he wants to pay for this with, uh, repeal of the capital gains exemption. This is Senate bill 11, 
Senate Bill 1086 that passed out of this off the Senate floor last week is going to the House. He's estimating that to get $50 million from that in year one. Um, he's uh, advocating for the expansion of gaming to include ball and dice, and that's $23 million. He is factoring in, capping the zero emissions tax credits that we talked about. I believe he wants to cap them at $25 million, not the $35 million that passed out of JCAB committees today. Um, he's estimating $80 million from that. And uh, he's rest, uh, estimating that the state will save $84 million a year from the Medicaid work requirement that has passed uh, that has passed in the uh, legislature last week and will be heard again next week. And then he also wants to end the luxury tax exemption. So right now there's a tax exemption for certain luxury items. He wants to get rid of that and estimates that we'll save $35 million. So you add all that up, that's $272 million. The reason that he chose those five things is because those are all things that both chambers can do with 51%. Interesting. So Senator Bergstrom is coming out and saying, look, I know this isn't everything, but it's about, you know, it's 30% of the raise for teachers that they've asked for. And it's, about 30% of the raise for public employees. It's about half the raise for support personnel, and it's all the education funding. And here's how you can pay for all of it without that 75% supermajority. That's not a bad deal. I mean, it could be definitely, if nothing else, this could serve as the backbone for a bigger plan, right? Right. And I, because I think, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this, that if we happen to only get these things, these 51 things that could be passed by a single party in both chambers, if they could get these, then that gets us part of the way there. Right, right, right. It's not enough. Right. But it's something. But it's, it's not zero. It's not zero. It's not zero. And it's not, it's not distasteful, I think, to either party. Right, right. For the I, most part. I, I think, you know, Democrats, obviously, I think are going to have issues with the Medicaid work requirement. Um, oh, is that part of it? Yeah, that's 84, well, that that's, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's 84 million. Um, so that's, you know, um, but it's it's there and it's and it's already passed. And I think, you know, if it's, I don't know that it's going to be heard on the opposite chamber. If it's heard, I think it passes. But are we still going to do an episode about how to apply for Medicaid and one of our quick fixes? Yes. I had to help someone the other day apply for Medicaid. It made me think about it. Yes. Yes. Um, the other thing, so... Um, continuing kind of on with Senator Bergstrom, one of the things that I like about Senator Bergstrom's plan, Senator Bergstrom's plan that's different than the 60 by 6 plan, he gives a lot of detail about year two. So in year two, the teachers and public employees are asking for another $2,000 pay raise for teachers, a $1,250 raise for support personnel, restoration of education funding, $75 million. $2,500 raise for public employees, and then another $21 million in funding for health care. So in year two, that's $321.5 million in new spending. Senator Bergstrom uh, has a $2,000 pay raise for teachers in year two, so 100% of the ask for teachers in year two. Uh, a $1,667 raise for support personnel in year two, so actually over what they've asked for okay. um, at a tune of $40 million. Another $75 million for education funding and another $1,000 for support personnel for public employees. So that's right there. That's $266 million in new spending in year two from Senator Bergstrom. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. He has outlined how to pay for this. He's got $400 million in new revenue in year two. It's from a $1 a pack tax on tobacco that he estimates would raise $170 million dollars. And this is maybe the most newsworthy thing of the whole plan. It's a 5% gross production tax. Whoa. Which has never been on the table, right? This is this well, is not, what, in, not on the table for actual consideration, but right. certainly a number that's been asked for before. Right. So 5% GPT, this is noticeable because this has been what Democrats in both chambers, but particularly the House, have essentially said, you want to get us on board for a deal. It's a deal that's got to include a 5% GPT. And Senator Bergstrom is putting it on the table here in in year two mm -hmm. as a way to fund it. Additionally, he's got $266 million of spending. He has $400 million in new revenue. You'll note that that's uh, a difference of $134 million. So um, in year three of the ask, the teachers ask for uh, – teachers and public employees ask for another $2,000 raise for teachers, bringing the total to ten. dollars a $1,250 raise for support personnel, $50 million of education funding, 
and a $2,500 raise for public employees for a total spending of $275.50, $275.5 million. Senator Bergstrom gives them 100% on the raise for teachers, $1,667 on the raise for support personnel, $75 million in education funding, and a $500 raise for public employees to the tune of $249 million. Um, and basically says, we're going to pay for this. We're going to pay for this with the 134 that's left over right. from year two, from gross production and tobacco. Interesting. It's not terrible, but, I mean, a $500 raise for almost everyone is paltry at best. It is, but remember, that's $500 on top of $1,000 they've gotten each year, oh, the, year the two years before. So I'm, it's a total of $2,500. i am just saying – Five hundred dollars a year is forty-two dollars a month before taxes. To- You're not getting into disagreement for me, but um, I just think that doesn't constitute a raise. But that's me. You know, and I think that's I think that's I think that's a completely valid point. And I'm not sitting here saying that Senator Bergstrom plan, Senator Bergstrom's plan is the one that like I would be voting for if I was at the Capitol. But the things things I want to highlight about this are one, he addresses every issue that they've asked for, right? Like he addresses every issue that that's they've true. asked for, that's good right? Point, he does, yeah. other than restoration of funding for healthcare, which is not like that's not a small thing, okay? But in terms of a pay raise for teachers, a raise for support personnel, restoration of education funding, and raise for public employees, he addresses all of those things. Public employees in his plan only get a total of twenty five hundred dollars. They're asking for seventy five hundred. Teachers in his plan only get a total of six thousand dollars. They're asking for ten. Support personnel and education funding get everything that they're asking for. Hmm. Um, and not only has he not only has he offered something in every area, he's offered a way to pay for it, right? So whether you think this is a good deal, whether you think it's a bad deal, whether you think it's dead on arrival, I think that it's commendable that this is somebody who's willing to put his name on a plan. Like this is what we ask legislators to do, right? Right. Yeah. Like he's coming out and saying, "Hey, you know what? Everybody wants ideas." Here's my idea. Well, yeah, let's put them all out there, and that's not going to hurt anything. So you know, I I think that I I I personally, you know, speaking for myself, I think that we can and should do better. But I want to give props to the senator for at least putting something out there. All right. Yeah. Shall we continue? Yes. All right. Last up, so I called this the backroom deal, and this is the backroom deal because this is a deal that's been published. It's out there. You know, nobody's officially taken responsibility for it. There's been some new reporting today that, you know, I think this is a plan that honestly is is probably sponsored by uh, Representative McBride, uh, Mark McBride. I think mm-hmm. he's kind of the he's the driving force behind this. So this is the backroom. This is the backroom deal. Um, we've already gone through what teachers are asking for. Um, the backroom deal is in year one a five thousand dollar raise for teachers for two hundred nine million, a two thousand five hundred dollar raise for support personnel at sixty five million, seventy five million dollars in education funding, a two thousand five hundred dollar raise for public employees, and two hundred and fifty million dollars in funding for healthcare. So they get a hundred percent of the healthcare funding. This gets a hundred percent of the healthcare funding, a hundred percent of the raise for public employees, a hundred percent of education funding, a hundred percent of the raise for support personnel, and it gives the teachers five thousand of the six thousand dollars that they're asking for. Hmm. So the only area this falls short is in asking for a raise for teachers. Uh, funding is in place. This also, this plan also has a gross production tax at five percent for two hundred million dollars. A dollar fifty per pack tobacco tax for two fifty. Motor view, motor fuels tax three cents a gallon for gas, six cents a gallon for diesel. Uh, capital gains exemption for one hundred and twenty million dollars. Um, capping the itemized deductions for individual income taxes. That's $108 million. New tax on hotels and motels for $50 million. Tax on ball and dice games for $22 million. And then coming out today, there is a uh, $1 per megawatt hour of power generated by wind farms right. that would be so part like of this a, as well. So like a GPT on wind. GPT on wind. That all together is going to come out to, I want to say right at like $971 million in funding. Hi-oh. Um, $971 million in funding for a new spending of $670 million. So this funds basically everything they're asking for. The only area it's kind of not hitting the mark is 5000 for teachers instead of six, and it gives you $300 to play with, $300 million to play with when it's done. Yeah, so they could bump it up a little bit if they needed to. And also, let's be honest, raising more revenue than what you actually need means they can cut some of these things or they could, in theory, pass them all and then legislators could 
vie for that extra money for pet projects. Right, right. Or they could restore some of the funds that have been cut. I mean, we already know from ONAS hey. that we're looking at 180 million deficit before we even start the fiscal year. Right? right. They could fund that. We could. I mean, they could actually like give. Hey, here's a bright idea. They could give education like a lump sum to buy all those textbooks next year, right. and then keep the money going at a right. better rate. Right. We could get rid of four day school weeks, as Senator McCourtney said. Um, we could uh, restore. Um, we could add teachers instead of cutting teachers, and actually have enough because we've even if we let's say we swapped out all the teachers now that are if we swapped out all the emergency certified teachers with with teachers that have, are trained to be teachers or yeah. experienced teachers, we'll say it that way. Um, we still need more, right? Because we've lost a bunch, we've consolidated, and this could be right. a, a way to bring that back, right? The other thing is, you know, if you're listening, you're probably thinking, "Man, Melson, it sounds like." It sounds like they're giving them everything they asked for. It sounds like the backroom deal is the way to go. Well, the the issue with the backroom deal is that's what they get in year one. There is nothing for years two and three. So, um, you know, it's twenty five hundred dollars for public employees in year one. They're asking for seventy five hundred. So mm-hmm. they get they get everything they're asking for in year one. They get nothing in years two and three. Teachers are asking for ten thousand. They get five thousand in year one, but nothing in years two and three. So, you know. Is any of that nine hundred and twenty two revenue recurring though? I mean, wouldn't they have? Oh yeah, to- yeah. It's all it's all recurring. Okay, but but you got but you've got six hundred and seventy million in new spending. You got to fund every year. Oh, that's true. So right, so you've got three hundred. You know, so you could, you know, you've got three hundred million here. So you could get most of the way there for the second year. Um, but you right. still have you to get up- another couple of thousand of teachers and maybe twelve hundred to support staff and. And all and twenty five hundred to public employees. And the thing is, you and I just spent that three hundred million on the one hundred eighty million dollar deficit and buying new textbooks. Oh right, right. That three yeah, that three hundred million that three hundred million you got left to play with. We, you and I, literally spent that in thirty seconds. Right. So and this and that's how quick the money goes. Right. I mean, it's like any of us, right? Like you get a bonus or you get a pay raise, and your expenses tend to rise to meet your spending. So, uh, you know, as as an example. I uh, got my tax return recently, and it wasn't that much, but um, you know, I think I got twelve hundred or something back, right? So I got my tax return, and you know, we were moving last week, and that money was quickly eaten up by having to pay a plumber to come fix a few things. I bought a new router for my internet, you know, like uh, just a few things, and I was like, man, I, to me, getting twelve hundred bucks felt like. I'm going to be, I can eat out. I'm living high in the hog for like two or three months. And it's gone. And it's gone. Right. Because life is expensive. And if you're paying for life and education for 700,000 students across the state, it gets really expensive in a hurry. No, 100%. So, you know, Alexa, like we'll we'll throw some version up on the web, maybe this version. Uh, we're going to have an infographic too. But, you know, I hope this has been a helpful, you know, I hope this has been a helpful discussion to you guys listening because it, it just, you know, I know we threw out a lot of numbers and a lot of, you know, percentages. and But, you know, even kind of putting this this spreadsheet together, like, is complicated. Like, this is, to, this is kind of to illustrate the point that Senator McCourney made that is, you know, even if you can – even if you can get everybody to agree, you know, it's complicated mm-hmm. to find out to find out where the money's going to go. And part of, you know, part of this is because we're so far in the hole, right? We're so far in the hole, and we're talking about, you know, uh, an, an ask from our public employees and our teachers that's one point four billion in new spending, on top of you know the billion and a half to two that we're we're already down. So, right. so, you know. That's what we're facing. That's what we're facing. All right, that brings us to the end of this episode. Remember, you can connect with us on Twitter and Instagram at Let's Fix This OK. Scott is at SC Melson. I am at Andy OKC. Please feel free to tweet at us, hit us up with any questions, thoughts, feedback. We'd love to hear it. You can also like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Let's Fix This OK. Our website is letsfixthisok.org, and on there you can sign up for our newsletter, read our blog, find resources and details about upcoming events. Don't forget that next week is our first Capitol Day of the year, March 28th, 9 a.m. at the Capitol. Hope to see you there. Our podcast is edited and produced by Scott and me, and Let's Pod This is a member of the Mostly Harmless Media Network here in Oklahoma. 
Our theme music is generously provided by the Sugar Free All Stars. Let's Fix This is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization who strives to educate and equip all Oklahomans to engage with their government. We encourage you to get involved in any way that you can. And remember, decisions are made by those who show up. We hope that you'll join us. Have a great week.